The Twitter hack fully explained who is hacking vaccine researchers and Zoom fixes a vanity URL vulnerability. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for July 21st, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. I wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who downloads the show via the RSS feed. It's linked down below in the show notes. I wanted to say that because we just surpassed 100,000 downloads of the video podcast version of ThreatWire, and that's a huge milestone, so that's really exciting. So thank you so much to everybody who watches the show via RSS or your favorite podcatcher. It's so cool. I'm very excited about that, and it makes me feel like really good about this show. So on to the news. So Twitter was hacked. We all know this. I will try to keep this story as concise and factual as possible because it would be really easy to go down into some kind of conspiracy theory with what happened and why. So let's go ahead and stick with what we know and what kind of mitigation we can see coming out of this. On Wednesday last week, all of a sudden, several cryptocurrency Twitter accounts started tweeting that they had partnered with Crypto for Health and they were giving back 5,000 Bitcoin to the community with a phishing link. Then a bunch of high profile verified accounts started tweeting and copy pasted Bitcoin scam to the world saying, basically I am doubling all payments made to my Bitcoin address for the next 30 minutes. You send 1K, I send you back 2K. And then at the end it had a Bitcoin address. And that Bitcoin address matched what was found on the phishing crypto for health link from the previous tweets. So accounts that were hit included Bill Gates, Mike Bloomberg, Joe Biden, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Uber, Apple, Mr. Beast, a whole lot more. It was a cryptocurrency scam, which not only was too good to be true, obviously, but it also preyed on the economic issues of the world and it preyed on human fear of missing out. According to the reports, the scammers made over $100,000 in Bitcoin using this technique. Now, soon after, users started noticing that these accounts had their email addresses changed by the attackers, likely to make it harder for the original users to gain access again. Now, Twitter posted through their Twitter support account, which I highly recommend you follow just in case they ever go down or something like this happens again, all about the issue and their response. The tweets were taken down by Twitter, not before tons of folks were able to grab screenshots, and Twitter ceased verified accounts' abilities to tweet, and they locked out users who were part of the breach or who had tried to change their password in the last 30 days, and some of those accounts are still locked out as of time of recording. Verified users could still retweet, so hilarity ensued with many users, myself included, about dramatic tweets, basically about being in Twitter jail. I was one of those people. Now, while many users found it funny that verified accounts could not tweet, that also meant that verified accounts who used Twitter to quickly post information about critical weather warnings or infrastructure issues were also being disabled, leading to the concern that a social network is being used for these kind of announcements as a main platform. Now, given that we can assume that these accounts had 2FA and they use good security hygiene, it was not likely that an attacker was able to fish or SIM swap alone or steal 2FA codes and passwords for all of these accounts at once. It was likely that the attackers bypassed security by using some kind of back-end administrative tool, and it turns out that speculation was correct. So Twitter posted that they believe this to be a coordinated social engineering attack targeted at employees who have access to internal systems and tools. Twitter stated that no passwords were accessed and resetting is not necessary. They believe 130 accounts were targeted in the Bitcoin scam, of which 45 accounts were accessed. In essence, the attackers initiated password resets for those accounts, they logged in, and then they tweeted the scam. Now, Twitter disabled the ability to download Twitter data during the investigation, but they found that eight of the accounts had their Twitter data downloaded by the attackers, but those eight accounts were not verified accounts. That does mean, though, that the attackers downloaded direct messages, photos, videos, address books, or other information through the download service for those eight accounts, and at this time, their investigation continues. Now, this scam could have been much, much worse. It could have been 
used for malicious acts, more malicious acts than just stealing money, and attackers could have used this to view direct messages or personal information of users, like email addresses and phone numbers associated with the accounts. It also begs the question, what is the internal admin tool that employees have access to that bypasses account security techniques? Well, according to Motherboard, where redacted screenshots of the internal tool were posted, though unredacted ones were floating around Twitter on Wednesday, I even saw some on my own Twitter feed, attackers paid off Twitter employees for access. Twitter actively removed tweets with the screenshot attached, and Twitter eventually responded saying that a small number of employees were targeted and manipulated into performing certain actions and divulging confidential information. Twitter stated that they would be rolling out additional company-wide training and they'd receive ongoing phishing exercises. But that is not enough for the FBI and lawmakers. Given that this threat could be used for much more than just a cryptocurrency scam, the FBI opened an investigation into the hack with concern that a coordinated attack such as this could be used to perpetuate foreign interference or to disrupt election integrity. Senator Ron Wyden, for example, brought up that direct messages are not end-to-end -end encrypted. Senator Ed Markey stated that Twitter must fully disclose what happened and what it is doing to ensure this never happens happens again. And Senator Jack Dorsey wrote a letter to Twitter requesting that the company reach out to the Department of Justice and the FBI and take any measures necessary to mitigate the risk. So who did it? Well, there are a few theories, but none of which are confirmed. Several outlets suspect scammers who target Twitter accounts of OG users, selling these accounts for $3,000 a pop. The reason for this connection, as reported by TechCrunch, is because the outlet has claimed to have seen Discord chats between people involved in account hijackings. The New York Times also shared this theory, along with Krebs on security. Now this is an ongoing investigation and the actual attackers have not been indicted, nor are any of these claims confirmed. So whomever the attackers are, they could still use whatever data they saw to make more money or create discourse. Users should be concerned. This hack not only shows that Twitter has a backend tool that allows for these kind of account takeovers, but it also brings to light that social media should not be used as the sole platform for important announcements such as weather warnings, for example. For verified users, this also shows that Twitter can lock their site and thousands of users' ability to post at any time. Our dependency on social media as a reliable source of information comes into question when it could be so easy for some attackers to disrupt that. It's much more important than it looks from just the surface, and Twitter needs to take proper steps to ensure that it does not happen again. On Thursday, British intelligence officials stated that pharmaceutical companies and academic institutions working on COVID-19 vaccines in the US, UK, and Canada are being targeted by Russian state-sponsored attackers. The attacks are being attributed to the hacking group called APT29, or Cozy Bear, which has been behind many attacks in the past decade, including the DNC 2016 leaks. The findings were published by the U.S. National Security Agency and the DHS, the U.K.'s National Cyber Security Center, and Canada's Communications Security Establishment. Now, a spokesperson for Putin refuted these claims, and Russia has also stated that they are working on human trials for their own vaccine, while trials are also underway within several different countries across the globe, in a worldwide attempt to stem this pandemic. Now, minimal technical details were publicized about these alleged hacks. The Post and the full report share that custom malware and phishing attacks are being used against vaccine researchers. The attackers are scanning the web for open servers, gaining access through known vulnerabilities that haven't been patched or mitigated, including several CVEs. And they could also be using stolen credentials for phishing attempts to gain persistent access. The custom malware is called WellMess and WellMail, which allows for attackers to issue malicious commands, upload or download files, and steal important information from target devices that they have infected. 
This activity, in fact, started in April and is currently ongoing. Now, because of this, the national agencies have recommended that companies keep devices up to date, use multi-factor authentication, train their staff for security, set up security monitoring, and prevent lateral movement from one device to another within their networks. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. Check out these amazing new fur baby photos from my Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons. They're totally awesome for sending them in. I love them as usual, so make sure to keep them coming. Also, a new perk has been added. Now, as a subscriber at any level, you will get access to action alerts. So anytime a new vulnerability is announced or a new breach has occurred, I will share details on Patreon so that you can update, you can patch, and you can find those flaws ASAP. Also, a big announcement that I have been waiting for. When I hit my next goal on Patreon, I will be signing up for Patreon's merchandise tool that I just got access to, I'm so excited, which will mean that you will get reoccurring merchandise and swag whenever you are new or an existing patron, and that will include several different tiers. That means that rewards will be automatically shipped to you worldwide after you've pledged for a set amount of time. And I will be adding new merch tiers to choose from, but current tiers will also unlock some merch rewards. Those will include things like t-shirts and hoodies and coffee mugs and stickers and hopefully a lot more. So this is alongside the current goal of an audio podcast because there is so much to cover in security and privacy. I never have time to discuss everything in these episodes. So if you want to see me cover more information information security news as an audio podcast, even a second episode of ThreatWire each week, check out the next Patreon goals to see how you can help make that happen. It is another week in 2020, and that means there's another Zoom vulnerability to talk about, but I promise I'll make this one quick. On Thursday, Checkpoint disclosed a vulnerability to Zoom that took advantage of Zoom's vanity URL feature. Now, the vanity URL allows companies to set up their own easy-to-memorize link for Zoom meetings. So, for example, I can make one that says threatwire.zoom.us. This also allows for single sign-on used by companies as well. Now, the issue would allow an attacker to spoof the company to steal credentials or sensitive information, and it has since been addressed as of recording. An attacker could pose as a real employee of a company and send a user a meeting invite from a fake vanity URL using their own subdomain instead. A user could be alerted by a slightly different URL if they practiced good security hygiene online. Now, this could allow the attacker to continue pretending to be an employee within a Zoom meeting to steal data obviously if nobody noticed. This is a minor flaw and it does require human interaction, but it is still easy to exploit. Thus, Zoom quickly fixed the problem by patching it within their platform. Before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Shwetag Aurora, DJ, Jeremy, Ben, Gabriel, Brett, Toby, and Candice who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you to each and every one of you. You are awesome. I love seeing so many people join up and I love our community. So make sure to join that Discord once you've signed up on Patreon. It's super fun. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.